Welcome, everyone. My name is Olivia Allen, and I am so proud to be part of Landmark Ventures, host of the Social Innovation Summit. Now, for those of you who might be tuning in who are maybe a little less familiar with the Social Innovation Summit, we are a bold platform designed to elevate groundbreaking ideas and innovative leaders who are changing the world for better. Over the last week, the Social Innovation Summit has had the great pleasure and opportunity to host a dynamic series of events during the convening of the United Nations General Assembly, or UNGA for short. We have partnered with incredible organizations over the week to magnify conversations and explore solutions to the biggest issues of the day. We did this both in person in New York City and also as we are today virtually. And today is going to be incredible as we round out the week. We've teamed up with Barclays for a very special webinar today to close out the series. We are excited to bring together four beyond belief leaders for a conversation centered around high growth entrepreneurs who are shaping a new regenerative economy. Now, social innovators and corporations, they can be unique allies in creating sustainable and scalable solutions that are not only on the leading edges of technology, but are also tackling the world's toughest, toughest problems right now, social and environmental challenges. By working together, they build an ecosystem of support that can broaden the reach of entrepreneurial solutions, accelerating their growth and impact. Now, in a few moments, we are going to hear from some amazing leaders about the importance of scaling and identifying approaches to strengthen the economy of tomorrow. First, we are honored to welcome Daniel Epstein, Chief Executive Officer of Unreasonable, who will provide an overview of the Unreasonable Impact Collaboration. We'll then shift to our featured panel for the day, which is a dynamic discussion between Daniel, Deborah Godfrey, who is the Head of Global Citizenship at Barclays, Dr. Lisa Dyson, the founder and CEO of Air Protein, and Corey Hale, the co-founder of CEO Culture Banks. Now, just a little bit of housekeeping. We've sent all of the attendees a digital brochure with the speaker bios and the agenda for today. We are taking questions from the audience that our panelists will answer towards the end of the discussion. So please don't forget to submit your questions. We really wanna make sure that you're engaged. And now I am so pleased to welcome our first speaker for today's event, Chief Executive Officer at Unreasonable, Mr. Daniel Epstein, over to you. All right, there we are. I, th I think it worked. I hope it worked. I believe everybody is tuning in. I, I want to begin with, with a debt of gratitude. Um, Olivia and the team at, at Landmark Ventures, I were really uh, grateful to have this platform and have this opportunity to share the conversation with everybody today. And uh, of course, uh, Debbie Goldfarb, the Global Head of Citizenship at Barclays, I'm you all have the creative courage and the audacity to strike up this unlikely partnership and a reasonable wouldn't be unreasonable without you and Dr. Lisa Dyson. I cannot wait to share with the audience and everybody who's tuning in the incredible work that you're leading at Air Protein. Um, but with, with that said, I feel like I owe the entire audience and everybody tuning in a favor, um, which is to begin by rationalizing a seemingly irrational name. Why is the organization I run called Unreasonable and our partnership with Barclays, why is it called Unreasonable Impact? And the person we can credit uh, our name with is the Irish playwright, George Bernard Shaw. George Bernard Shaw is famous for saying that the unreasonable person, or sorry, that the reasonable person adapts themselves to the world, the unreasonable one uh, adapts the world to themselves. Therefore, all progress is dependent on the unreasonable individual. Now, if George Bernard Shaw is right, if all progress depends on our reasonable people, then we can't afford not to bet on the world's most unreasonable individuals, which is exactly why we've teamed up with Barclays to support, bet on, uh, and help scale up the efforts of entrepreneurs like Dr. Lisa Dyson, who we'll be hearing from shortly. I, I have the privilege uh, for the next eight minutes or so to um, outline a little bit of the why behind our partnership um, and a little bit of the what. Um, and then we're going to really dig into the conversation with you all on the panel. Um, so to do this properly, I'm going to attempt to do something that's always dangerous in the world of Zoom, uh, which is to share my screen and hopefully this comes through. Um, I wanted to start here. As Olivia mentioned, right now the UN General Assembly is gathering. Um, it's the largest uh, gathering of world leaders. Um, once a year, they come together to set uh, the agenda 
uh, that they believe we all need to rally behind. And of course, this is not the first time that the United Nations General Assembly has happened, uh, but I want to take us back in time a little bit before we talk a present, about the present. I am to go back to the year 2000. Um, 21 years ago in September 2000, the UN General Assembly got together uh, and they laid out what they identified as the Millennium Development Goals. Um, but these were goals around healthcare, these were goals around the climate crisis. I, um, but number one on their list on the agenda for the United Nations Millennial Development Goals to be achieved by 2010 was to half the number of individuals living in absolute poverty. Um, this slide actually should really say billions of dollars. They are not billions, just say trillions of dollars. They had trillions of dollars uh, behind this global effort. 189 nations signed on to it. They had the global infrastructure to pull off these goals. Even Bono was supporting the UN Millennial Development Goals. And the question is what happened to the number one priority of the United Nations when they came together 21 years ago? Um, and this graph really says it all. Um, if we zoom into the region of the world where uh, those living in absolute poverty is the highest percentage, uh, between 1990 and 2010, uh, yes, there was a decrease in individuals living in absolute poverty, um, but it's not a decrease I think that we should be proud of. It went from 44.6% to 44%. Um, what is terrifying about this number is because of population growth. That means that there were uh, more than 140 million more individuals living in absolute poverty I am 10 years after the Millennium Development Goals were set than when we began that journey. Uh, so now, as we look at the present day and the United Nations is coming together to tackle these global crises, uh, it's our belief that we need to have a slightly different approach. Um, Einstein is famous for saying that insanity has a simple definition. It's doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Uh, it's our belief, our team at Barclays and our team at Unreasonable uh, that we need to deconstruct and then reconstruct and reimagine how we go about solving the world's hardest problems. Uh, and in this case, in our partnership, we're focused on solutions in the green economy uh, that are leading to a more sustainable and regenerative future, uh, as well as inclusion with the world of work. Um, and how do we scale up entrepreneurs at the job creators of today and tomorrow? So, so that brings us to Unreasonable Impact. I am a multi-year partnership, it's a global partnership uh, with Barclays uh, I, uh, that uh, has, has reaches across Asia, Pacific, uh, UK, Europe, uh, the US and, and the Americas. And we'll dig into this a little bit more together as a panel, but I wanted just to give a high level overview. Um, today we're supporting uh, over 200 companies with the Unreasonable Impact Partnership and in, in collaboration with Barclays. And these companies have operations um, or have an impact in market in over 180 countries. This is just a quick um, shot of uh, where, where they're operating right now. Um, across the 207 CEOs that we're supporting, um, in the last number of years, they've, they've generated over $3.8 billion in revenue. Um, they've raised more than $5 billion in financing. The most important statistic here is that they're positively measurably impacting the lives of over 250 million individuals around the world. I know part of our efforts here are to scale up companies as job creators. And today they're supporting over 130,000 jobs around the world. Uh, so, so to make it real, I'm just gonna tell some quick stories of a few of the companies uh, that, uh, that will transition into the panel. Uh, but th this is an image, I'm, I'm in Manhattan right now. So if I looked across the Hudson, um, you, you would see these facilities. Uh, they're out in New Jersey. It's a company called Aero Farms, one of the companies that we support in the fellowship. Um, Aero Farms is the largest indoor, indoor hydroponic farm in the world. Uh, it's, it's pretty incredible technology. It's over 380 times the efficiency of traditional agriculture. So what would take 380 acres uh, to yield produce, um, they can do in one acre. They can do this without soil and without sunlight. Uh, they're right now, um, uh, supporting hundreds of jobs and looking to scale globally. Uh, but this is one that hits close to home because it's just right around the corner. And it's a perfect example of the types of technologies that we believe are going to be a big part of the future economy. Uh, another, another company that we support is General Fusion. Uh, they're based out of Canada. Uh, what they're trying to do is uh, give unlimited clean energy to the world um, for millions of years. That is not an exaggeration. Uh, fission is when we break apart atoms and we get uh, um, um, some pretty intense byproducts as, as we all know, um, fusion is bringing them together and in essence striving to in a steady state recreate the center of the sun. Uh, this is their first prototype. Um, the targeted goal is to get plasma to 50 million uh, degrees Kelvin. I am uh, and uh, they're um, not there yet. We would all know about it. It would be in every headline of every newspaper around the world, um, but they're able to get over 30 million degrees Kelvin. 
I am in a steady state. I am, and I, we believe that although this is a uh, a long shot um, out of the private fusion companies that we've looked at around the world. Um, we really believe in General Fusion's efforts and have come together to support them. Uh, here's an example of transportation. We hear about electric vehicles everywhere and electric vehicles are critical uh, in terms of the ecosystem of solutions that we need to transition uh, into the next generation of business. Uh, but this car here, uh, it's a Welsh couple out of Wales that has designed it and it's a hydrogen cell powered vehicle. Um, an amazing car called, uh, the company's called River Simple. And in this vehicle, it was their first prototype. Uh, it runs off of hydrogen. The only thing that comes out of the exhaust pipe is purified hot water. You could actually drink that water uh, if you wanted to. And off one liter, it can go over 300 kilometers. Uh, and so our effort in this partnership is to help take these types of technologies to market and to scale them globally. Uh, I'll give you two more quick examples. Um, here's a company called Zero Mass Water. This is their uh, product that's in market right now. It's in over 35 countries and it's providing drinking water uh, to people around the world. Um, the technology here is called atmospheric water generation. Um, what this panel does is with 3% humidity in the air, which means it works in the desert, uh, it can create up to 40 liters of clean drinking water every single day. Uh, incredible technology. Um, you don't have to plug it into anything. Um, it exists on its own. It's an independent platform. I am, and it is able to use um, some pretty advanced physics um, to make this work. I am, uh, I, this company uh, here, uh, incredible business, I am, uh, biocarbon engineering, um, now called Dendra. Uh, they're a drones company and they're striving to reforce the planet. Um, their goal is to plant over a trillion trees profitably um, within the next 20 years. Uh, this drone, um, hovers above the ground and fires seed pods that are already gestated of different trees into the ground. Um, it's able to, with two operators, like you can see in this image, plant over 100,000 trees in one day. Uh, they have large operations now across Southeast Asia. I am, and if we're going to plant more than a trillion trees, which we have to, uh, we're going to need technologies like this. And the last word, which I'll be really brief because Dr. Dyson is going to describe this to us in detail. And what you see on this plate is chicken. Uh, this chicken is made out of air. Uh, so one of the companies we support, you'll hear from the founder and CEO um, that business is called Air Protein. Um, and to say it is exciting is an understatement. Um, so th those are six examples of the 207 um, that we are currently supporting. I think if you know, we, look, we look at this a little more philosophically, um, what we're trying to do in this partnership with Barclays is to disprove this belief. Um, a lot of people, um, maybe 10 years ago, really believed that doing well and doing good were on opposite ends of the spectrum. Uh, do well, you'd make a lot of money, and then you would take that and you would philanthropically contribute that back to the world. Um, we would argue uh, that the reality is at least one more dimension. Uh, it was two-dimensional at the very least, um, and they're on an X and Y axis. Um, and in this case, um, doing good on the X axis, doing well on the Y axis. I mean, what this symbolizes is in the top top left corner here, you know, maybe maybe this dot, this is somebody who is doing extremely well financially. I am at the expense of everybody um, around them. I am, and so I, we, we won't label who that is, but there could be uh, some politicians, depending on your belief system, who may very well live up there. Uh, and if we go across these lines, maybe this is a bank robber here. They're doing really well, not much good in the world. If we drop down uh, to the bottom quadrant, um, to the lower right, I, um, here that might be a volunteer, a Red Cross volunteer. Um, and in you know, the quadrant that's the top right, you see that blue dot um, where somebody's doing a lot of good and they're doing reasonably well. Um, this is, we believe where most people think that social innovation uh, lives, but what we're trying to prove in this partnership is that there's a new reality, that the future, future titans of industry will be the businesses who are solving the world's most meaningful uh, and seemingly intractable problems because that's where the most value is. Uh, we believe that companies like Air Protein are leading the charge on that. Uh, and to be in this partnership with Barclays to help scale up the efforts of these businesses uh, is a privilege of a lifetime. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna transition us uh, back to the panel uh, where we can have a conversation back and forth, um, but really appreciate the opportunity and uh, I'll pass it back to the team. Okay, I think I am back, perfect. Daniel, thank you so much. The work that you all are doing at Unreasonable, I mean, to say that the world needs it is an understatement. I just can't think of a better way to bring it all together. But I also 
want to introduce the rest of our lovely panelists, which we did have a, a brief introduction of them, but I want to bring them back in because we do have Debbie Goldfarb and Dr. Lisa Dyson, both extraordinary women that are doing extraordinary work. And with that, I just want to start throwing some questions out to you all. And you know what, I'm going to kick it off with you, Debbie, because Barclays, you guys are doing this long-term partnership with Unreasonable. Why did you choose to form this partnership? And what is the opportunity that you saw when the, in terms of what the impact could be with joining forces with them? Sure. Uh, thanks so much, Corey, and incredibly uh, excited to be here today uh, with Daniel and, and Dr. Lisa Dyson. Um, for us, the principal reason we started this partnership is that we believe in the power of entrepreneurship. As, as you just heard from Daniel, where most people see challenges, entrepreneurs see um, solutions and innovation. You then wrap this innovation with a strong business model and you're setting the stage to scale solutions that this world needs most. For us, the Unreasonable Impact Partnership allows us to bring the best of Barclays. Um, from our longstanding uh, experience of over 300 years, our colleagues and our clients, to these pioneers who are revolutionizing their sectors. I think for, for some, um, and, and we first started this, uh, Barclays and Unreasonable uh, seem like an unlikely partnership. But what we both share in common is a belief that these high growth ventures who are being led by extraordinary entrepreneurs such as Dr. Lisa Dyson, who you'll have an opportunity to hear more from, who I would like to go on record as saying, I think will win a Nobel Prize. She's exceptional, totally agree. right? <laughs> she, she's, she's definitely winning this. Um, no pressure, Lisa, but you've got this. And, uh, but, but these folks are, are best positioned to solve the world's hardest social and environmental challenges. And this partnership, um, you know, these companies are operating at the nexus of profit and purpose, maximizing both at the same time. And I think for us at Barclays, this aligns so well to our business in that we can leverage our expertise and also tap into our most valuable resource, our colleagues, to drive a positive impact in society. That's excellent. Thank you so much for that, Debbie. And I want to bring in Dr. Lisa Dyson. I'll just call her Dr. Dyson going forward. Um, you were a fellow, 2017, Unreasonable was in its second year. Before we get into what made you even want to become a fellow with Unreasonable, I am purely fascinated with air protein, but I have no idea what it is. Can you please start there <laughs> with the awesomeness, which is air protein? Yes, yes, absolutely. And so wonderful to be here. Thanks so much for having me. And yes, I'll talk about what we're doing at Air Protein. So we are making meat, as Daniel said, from elements of the air. Everything from chicken to beef to pork and beyond are what we are aiming to do with our technology. Uh, and we do it with this core innovation that we have around the protein itself, this ingredient that we're making with a process that's like fermentation. So like making yogurt, brewing beer, making cheese, but redefined, reimagined. And the way that we reimagine it is that currently fermentation actually produces carbon dioxide when you make yogurt or cheese. Whereas now we're actually using carbon dioxide, an element of the air that we're breathing right now as an input. And as a result, we're able to make a carbon negative protein ingredient, add culinary techniques to get textures, and then we're able to make something that's just like the chicken that you're used to biting into when you have your chicken sandwich. I'm so fascinated. I don't know where I can go to get some of this air protein, but <laughs> it's also like lunchtime here in New York. So I'm, <laughs> hungry, so I'm super interested in getting my hands on this. And can you just talk a little bit about your relationship as a fellow um, with Unreasonable and what made you want to be a part of the program? 
Absolutely. So when I was first contacted by the team at Unreasonable, I thought it was another accelerator or, you know, I'd been a part of business plan competitions and those types of things. And the way they talked about it was that this was something completely different. And, and, you know, I was kind of surprised, like, can this be real? So I talked to a couple of the entrepreneurs that had already been a part of their program. And I began to hear that they're doing something different over there. Uh, and I was amazed once I joined that this is something different. They're able to bring together, convene people. You know, this we is greater than I you know, kind of core value that they have is demonstrated time and time again. And we've gone, we've, you know, have people that we've hired from Unreasonable. We've ended up getting investment from Barclays through our Unreasonable connection, but it's just really convening people together, creating brain trust and those types of things to really accelerate the impact that these impact entrepreneurs are looking to have in the world. I love that. I mean, this whole thing is so fascinating to me. What Unreasonable does, how you're able to tap into dynamic entrepreneurs like Dr. Dyson, which brings me back to you right now, Daniel, because the theme that Unreasonable is exploring around regeneration specifically as we come out of this pandemic, hopefully fully come out of the pandemic <laughs> sooner rather than later. Let me throw that out there. And we're going to be looking for new ways of having the economy truly support um, people remain or regain balance with nature, right? There's been a lot of that discussion throughout the pandemic. How is Unreasonable and partnerships like the ones that you all have with Barclays through Unreasonable Impact moving us further in that direction, in the spirit of inertia, so to speak? That's right. That's right. Um, I'm with you, Corey. Uh, I wish we were doing this one in person, uh, but here we are. <laughs> um, and, you know, what, what I would say is, and, and Debbie touched on this, um, I think the biggest way we're trying to move that inertia is to, to show what's actually possible to the broader capital markets, right? We, we all know that you can make a lot of profit without purpose, right? And that, that unfortunately has been a lot of business to date. And we also know that you can have a great deal of purpose without profit, hence, hence the nonprofit world. But the, the belief, the thing that we want to prove to the entire world and the entire financial industry uh, is that if you want to maximize either of those, profit or purpose, you need to maximize both at the same time. Uh, and so that is why we're dedicated to exclusively supporting businesses where the impact that they want to have on the world, this regenerative, sustainable impact, is baked into the DNA of their profit model. And if what we can show is with that entrepreneurs like Dr. Dyson, right? They can not only win a Nobel prize, but make a multi-billion dollar business. That starts to shift industries. I, I, I think in the direction that we all need, we, we all know we need to go. Um, and I, I would also say, you know, the, some of the companies that I mentioned, the technology that I mentioned, it might, it might feel like science fiction, but it's nonfiction. Uh, they are all real. These are all highly functional businesses. They're employing hundreds of people each. I am, you know, on average, they've raised or made over $80 million. Um, it's real businesses in the market. Um, and we're doing everything we can to help support them and scale them faster. Um, and, and that word faster is really important um, because in this case, impatience is a virtue. And, and I would say, you know, unreasonable, we could try to do this on our own. Uh, we would have failed at the start. The key here is our partnership with Barclays, an over 300 year old financial institution who understands scale cross-continentally and has the experience that the entrepreneurs we're all looking to support need to scale faster. Because when it comes to the climate crisis, winning slowly is the same thing as losing. Like we have to transition quickly. And the way we're gonna transition quickly is to show that these stories, that these are in essence of these companies, these are the future titans of industry. These will be the largest companies in the world. They will be the most substantial because they're solving the most meaningful problems. And I think, you know, that's a little bit theoretical, but that's what we're really trying to prove here. I love that. If, you, if you're not thinking big and just unbelievable things, then we're not going to get to where we need to be as, you know, humanity as a whole, which actually reminds me, everyone, I forgot to put out this call to action to remind everyone joining us right now that you can ask questions directly to all of our panelists. I'm so sorry, I forgot that off the top. Please drop all of your questions, comments, um, things that you know are important to you that you would love to hear what our panelists think. You can just drop that directly um, into the chat area and we'll be sure towards the end of the discussion to make sure that we are able to directly answer some of your questions. So don't forget, whenever you something comes to your mind, please just 
drop that in there. Okay, now back to the questions here. And I wanna bring it back to you, Debbie, because Daniel just went through some of the, um, some of the ways of why this impact work um, is so important. And you've been doing this impact work at Barclays over, over a long period at this point. What would you say the impact of Barclays work has been over the past five years? Sure. Um, so as I think about the power of this program, it's been extraordinary to see the impact across our business, our clients, and our colleagues. Um, I think we, we would all agree that over the past five years, the ESG and sustainability space has changed so much, and Unreasonable Impact has helped to both inform our thinking and, uh, and respond to these issues. Uh, we've seen an increasing demand from our clients, and Barclays launched the first of its kind sustainable and impact banking team, specifically to focus on sustainable companies. And what's incredibly exciting is as these uh, ventures come through the Unreasonable Impact program and they scale and they grow, we're able to introduce them to our bankers to help you know, plug them in to raise capital. When I think about our research franchise, um, it was really cool to see, you know, just a few weeks ago, we had several of the companies featured at both our energy and consumer staples global conferences as examples of the future of their industry. Within our sustainable capital impact initiative, we've actually been able to directly invest in several of the ventures, including Air Protein. And within our own operations, we have been able to bring in several of the company's products and also plug them into our supply chain. I think for us, um, as I mentioned, you know, from a colleague perspective, I think this program has managed to capture the imaginations of our colleagues over the past five years with hundreds getting involved with offers to help. And I think for, for us, this is really a chance to see firsthand the you know, pioneering technology and thinking of these ventures and you know, demonstrate to our colleagues what a profitable company can and should be. And um, it's also really encouraging to note that this enthusiasm for the program is, is within and outside Barclays. And we're incredibly proud, as, um, as some of these folks have alluded to, to be able to make meaningful connections to help these companies scale. I think for us, um, this program helps uh, to provide the resources to both educate and inspire our next generation of leaders to help our clients tackle these challenges successfully to create both a long lasting and positive impact on society. Corey, I, I love wanna, that. You guys are doing lots of great work. No, go ahead. Oh, I, just wanna, I just want to underline what, what Debbie mentioned. Yeah, in, in, seven, in the last seven years, a new coverage unit for the investment bank at Barclays hasn't been created. And they created the first one on Wall Street for sustainable impact investing. And they're leading the way. And what's so exciting to me about that is they're such a global leader that when once Barclays does that, it puts that out on Wall Street and starts to see the types of opportunities that they're seeing, then Wall Street will shift in that direction. And I think that in our partnership, Barclays has had kind of the creative courage, I would say, to to go out on a limb and to do something that's totally unlikely to Debbie's initial point, partnering with an organization called Unreasonable to launch this initiative that you know, sounded almost like a fairy tale at first, but now is really grounded in reality and in markets. Um, but it's, it's a big deal. And I think we're all privileged to be a part of this. And it's a, it's a demonstration of everybody talks about competitive advantage in business. I think that the 21st century, what we're going to see is that the real winners in industry are going to focus on the collaborative advantage. And, and that's, that's what we're all doing here together. Mm -hmm. I, and it might seem unlikely, but I, I think it's a kind of beacon of where industry is going to move. So just wanted to underline, it's so <laughs> awesome that the, the bank is changing because of working with entrepreneurs like, like Dr. Dyson. Well, that's perfect because we actually need more banks like Barclays, right, to step up to the plate and be supporting these entrepreneurs, if not directly, then indirectly through organizations like Unreasonable. And I'm just going to go out here and throw my own personal journey into this for a second. And Dr. Dyson, bring you back into this because being an entrepreneur, it can definitely feel like a lonely journey and Fortunately, with you being um, one of the fellows of Unreasonable, it seems like that community, right, that they have around them, that they are able to extend to their fellows and to other entrepreneurs, um, would have a very valuable 
a very valuable place in creating impact. Is that something, Dr. Dyson, that you felt? And I would love for you, Daniel, to also jump in on this as well in terms of how you guys are able to create community for the entrepreneurs in your program. After you, Lisa. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, I think that the way that Unreasonable does create community is quite frankly, unparalleled, kind of the convenient convenings that they have and the quality and caliber of, of both in companies as well as the ecosystem that's created around those companies is, is something amazing and that I haven't seen uh, elsewhere. And so one thing that I'll highlight is within this collaborative, within this, this collective, I'll call it, uh, are all these uh, these entrepreneurs that are doing things that, that may sound unreasonable. So I think the ability to, to have these people as partners in thought, um, as collaborators, as co-creators of, of different things, we're actually partnered with one of the other unreasonable companies to do a project together. We've received grants from unreasonable. Um, we've worked with many people that are part of the network, whether it's brand development people, culture design gurus and beyond. And so I think that the, the community of, of just people who are thinking beyond the status quo that unreasonable group has been able to bring together is unparalleled and amazing. And so to your point, yes, it can be a lonely journey being an entrepreneur, but the unreasonable group has made it a little less lo lonely and has surrounded uh, those, those like myself with others that are focused on impact. Yeah, maybe I, you know, I, I would say just to riff off that, Lisa, um, there's a, you know, there's no shortage of good ideas in the world. Uh, at least we all think we have them all the time. I, and, and right now you look at the capital markets, there's not a dearth of capital. There's, there's a ton on the sidelines. What there is a dearth of is, is courage. I, I think that it takes a very rare type of individual to risk everything that they have, their reputation, a lot of their relationships, their capital, their time, their sleep, uh, towards trying to will something into existence that all of us probably think is impossible, like making meat out of air. Uh, and one of the biggest, I think, services that we're doing in this partnership with Barclays is, is making that journey less lonely. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that's a real service because we need uh, individuals like Lisa to succeed. Our future literally depends on it. And our kids' future really depends on it. I am, and so I think that's a big part of what we're trying to do, Corey, is um, create a community of support. Um, at the end of the day, that's really what we're doing. And, and this community is powerful. I mean, the, the, you know, we work with over 700 mentors as part of a reasonable impact. And they include folks like Ariana Huffington and Seth Godin and, you know, heads of Fortune 50 companies and, you know, members of the board and the most senior leadership of Barclays across the entire globe. And I, I think it's, uh, it's been a treat to see uh, what we can do uh, with with business uh, and when we put community first. And, and to me, it's almost taking banking back to what it originally was intended to be. Right? Banking was relationships. It used to be rooted in trust uh, between people. And I think that that's what's happening here with Barclays and how, how they're showing up. And it's a long-term play. Right? It's how do we add as much value as humanly possible to these individuals on the front lines wielding these advanced technology some of these hard problems so that in the future, when they do need a bank to work with, they're going to want to work with the one who's, who's always been there to help and support because it's rooted in relationships. Um, but I, I like that you called that out, Corey, because being an entrepreneur is hard. Uh, it, it and is hard. Hopefully we can make it less hard. Yeah. Well, I, I think there are a lot of things that go into that. But, but yes, we should make it um, a much easier journey. But one of the things that tremendously helps entrepreneurs, besides the community, besides the relationships and actually was having this conversation at a SIS dinner last night is capital mm -hmm. and access to capital. And I think Debbie, the, the work that you all are doing, not just in the partnership aspect um, with unreasonable impact, but in the seeding of actual capital, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how many people say they're providing resources. I mean, you still need the actual money, like, yeah. you, you do. You need the money to help grow the companies. How important is it um, that you guys were able to actually seed capital into what Dr. Dyson's building? I, I think for us, the opportunity to help facilitate this transition to a low carbon economy is something that's critical. That's a huge priority for our bank. And as we've seen, we've seen 
a host of initiatives set up to support this from our sustainable and impact banking team to our thematic research team. And I think it's something um, that is on the front minds of, of all of our leaders. And I think, um, you know, as I think about this point of, of helping these companies scale and grow, um, one of the things for us, and I think we would all agree that it is um, the impact that these companies are having is extraordinary, right? It, it, it's awe inspiring. Um, but the scale of the challenge is huge. And I think it really does take a village. We've just heard from Lisa, we hear from so many entrepreneurs how lonely this journey can be. And so, um, I'd actually, Corey, if it's okay, I'd love to make an ask of this community that is that is here with us today, um, and that is to come join us. Um, there are a couple of different ways that you all can get involved in this partnership. The first is as a mentor. As, as Daniel mentioned, we are always looking for mentors and partners who can help these companies to, um, to think through their business challenges and provide introductions that can help them to accelerate their growth. Um, additionally, we host demo days. So uh, we now host these demo days virtually for each cohort. And it's an incredible opportunity for these entrepreneurs to be able to share pitches about their business and give insight into the future of their industries and for all of you to, to then uh, connect with the company. So whether you care about data center operations or renewable energy or food or transportation, we, we'd love for you to be there. Um, I feel like we're running out of time. I just a couple of quick ways I want to just mention to get involved. We're always looking for great ventures. Please reach out if you think they fit. And if you want to connect with any of these companies, if you go to unreasonableimpact.com, you will see our digital book, the digital book of ventures, which shows the 200 companies strong, and we are happy to facilitate introductions. Um, I think I shared Daniel's sentiment in that it is a huge honor for us to be to play even a small part in the important work that these companies are leading. Um, and as the mom of a six-year-old who is like a little eco warrior in the making, you know, we, we owe it to our kids and to our grandchildren to create a cleaner, greener future. So in, in the spirit of, you know, Sustainable Development Goal 17, um, please come join us. I've got this URL, right, Daniel? Unreasonableimpact.com slash connect is, is how you can get in touch. So I would really just love for you to all come and join us as we build a cleaner, greener future. I, I love to hear that. Okay, I, I'm not sure I have one more enough time for one more question, but I want to get this in really, really quickly before we turn it over to Q&A, because there are a lot of people in the SIS community who are entrepreneurs and innovators, and they always have lots and lots of questions around funding. And for you, Dr. Dyson, you were able to get funding directly from Barclays. Are you having conversations? Have you had conversations with other corporates and what role does impact really have in those conversations around funding? Good, good question. So I've been in sort of climate tech technology building for the last decade. And what I would say is that when I initially got into the space, uh, investors almost looked at sustainability as, as uh, their philanthropy or nonprofit or what have you, uh, and didn't really look at businesses as much as being able to generate a return that has sustainability as a core focus. And now that has changed dramatically. Now there's so much more of an understanding that you can have impact and you can build a, a great business as well. Just as Daniel said, companies like organizations like Unreasonable Group uh, driving kind of that knowledge that you can do well and do good is something that we're seeing uh, you know, grow significantly and an indication an indicator of that is really even Barclays Sustainability Fund, which did invest into uh, air protein, which we're excited about. So we're seeing this, this change happening where impact now is becoming table stakes, even in some cases, larger and larger funds. You know, there's billion dollar funds that are being launched that impact or climate is really a part of, part of the focus. And so that's, that's a positive thing and a change that we're definitely uh, seeing as a trend in the marketplace. I love that. Thank you so much to, to all the panelists for just being so open um, and transparent with the, the work that you guys are doing in the impact space. And I know I told everyone at the top, we are going to get to Q&A. Don't worry, keep dropping those questions in. Um, let's go ahead and turn it over to our audience and our community because that's why we're really here to learn and benefit from one another. So Daniel, this first question, 
from the SIS community is for you. And they want to know what are some of the best practices for a successful partnership such as this one? Um, and what do you think the secret has been? And I'm sure that partnership is on both fronts, not just with Barclays, but also, you know, having the successful relationships with your fellows. Yeah. Okay. Great question. I am with Barclays. Get lucky enough to I am get to know people like Debbie Goldfarb, um, who are true entrepreneurs within institutions and are willing to do something that's brave and hard. Uh, it hasn't been done before. That's that's part of it. What, what I mean by that is, I am real relationships. I you know it's kind of getting back to what I was saying earlier. Like yes, business is business, but more so than anything, business is people. And the greatness of what we achieve will be through the caliber of the relationships that we hold. Um, and that's deeply human. Uh, so sp spend time getting to know people as people. Uh, and then, for, you know, for us, when we look at multinational partnerships or partnerships with governments, um, what we look for is true trajectory alignment. Uh, we've turned down multiple partnerships when what it felt like was, was sponsorship, when it felt like it was a brand who wanted to do good in the world, which is great. I, I am, but that the only intention was to tell those stories. And, and what we want to see is core business alignment and, and, and trajectory alignment because sponsorship, I would say, kind of feels like AstroTurf. Like everybody knows it isn't real. Uh, and what's been so exciting to work with Debbie and the citizenship team of the broader bank at Barclays is that this is core business agenda. They want to be you know, the most sophisticated, the most effective, and the best performing sustainable bank in the world. And, and in that case, if, if we could be part of that path and walk down that road with them and, and you know, help through this partnership, uh, accelerate that transition faster. Like what, what a privilege. Uh, but I, I would say look for partnership, not sponsorship uh, and focus in on true human relationships because at the end of the day, that's what moves the needle. Um, and it takes a long time. So be patient um, because uh, it's, it's hard. Right? It's hard to shift institutions uh, you know, as large as Barclays or any multinational in the world. Uh, and so part of this is both patience and impatience are virtues. And I think as an entrepreneur, the ability to hold both at the same time uh, is, is really important for your mental health. Uh, but at the end, I am, that's just the reality of it. Um, and you want both. I don't know. Did I answer your question or not your question, but the, the question? No, part? no. You, you yeah. answered the question for okay. sure. Cool. Um, I want to keep it moving, though, because we actually have lots and lots of interest. Can I just say, Dr. Dyson, they are going crazy right now in the q and <laughs> For you and air protein. I'm just, I'm trying to spread the love to all the panelists, but let me just tell you, they want to hear from Dr. Dyson. Oh, and guess not me. Okay, they want the air protein. Yes. Yeah, we're they used to it. Yeah. Air okay, <laughs> I was like, I don't want you, I don't, Debbie, you're fabulous, and Daniel, so no, 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 let's, Lisa, <laughs> all amazing. But they want to know, Dr. Dyson, where can they get this air protein? Is it available in stores? They just want the basic, like, I don't know. Is there a website? How do they get their hands on it ASAP? Awesome. Well, well definitely they can go to airprotein.com and sign up for our newsletter and we'll keep them abreast. But as you can imagine, making protein from air is not easy to do. Uh, we've done it, of course, and we're now scaling that technology. And so we'll be in market soon to debut at a store near you. Right now we have uh, sort of taste testing moments that we open up to various people, but get on our newsletter and you will find out when we're in a store near you. <laughs> okay, get on the newsletter, everyone. That's how you get your hands or at least a taste test on the air protein. Someone else wants to know, Dr. Dyson, what is the actual nutritional content of air protein? <laughs> Great question. And, and Great people question. are getting into like the details. <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> so it's nutrition is one of our core pillars. So sustainability is how we started, how we got into this game. And we started by saying, how do you make the most sustainable protein in the world? And that's really what we're focused on doing and what we believe we, we we're doing now. Uh, and then nutrition is really important as well. And so we start off with a core ingredient that has all the essential amino acids. So it's a complete protein rich in bioavailable minerals and bioavailable iron uh, and, and bioavailable um, vitamins as well. So including vitamin B12, which is lacking in a vegan diet. Uh, so nutrition is kind of a core pillar for, for what we're doing. And then of course we have to do all that and put it in a nice tasty package. And the package that we're putting it in is, is meat. I love that. I, I feel like so many people right now that are joining this conversation are like, oh, all right, all of this sounds good. This sounds right up my alley. 
And I cannot wait for this to just fully be out in market and we can just get it any time of day. But I'm gonna give Dr. Dyson a break right now and move our questions back over to our, our lovely other two panelists because this one's for you, Debbie. One of our community members wants to know how is COVID-19 or has it in any way, shape or form affected, you know, the program affected the work that the bank is doing. I'm thinking more so has it brought it into a bigger focus for you, for the firm? Yeah, no, it's, um, it's a great question. And I think as you can imagine, um, the in-person connectivity and, and on-site collaboration that happens is, is so critical to a program like this. So for us, it was a huge feat. And I remember Daniel, it was March and we had Jennifer Holgram from Lanza Tech like flying to the UK and we're like, cancel, it's March 13th, there's this COVID. <laughs> um, and so for us, we had to pivot real time and think about how are we gonna keep people safe and how do we keep driving the impact? And so, um, we immediately pivoted the program to virtual and, and that was challenging, but it did unlock some, I think, surprising new opportunities for us. Um, so we continued to welcome ventures uh, into the Unreasonable Impact program. Um, and from a colleague engagement standpoint, it was actually really powerful because normally if colleagues weren't you know, available on site to volunteer and, and help Lisa think through challenges, they wouldn't have been eligible to participate. But now all of a sudden we could get experts from the UK, from the West Coast, from Asia. And so it was able to help us really scale the impact of who we could help her connect to. The other thing we saw is that we launched several digital summits and this was an opportunity for us to really, um, support and, and highlight the incredibly heroic work that these companies were doing as they were responding in the pandemic. So they weren't just keeping their businesses running, they were actually pivoting their tech and their talent to help communities. So whether that be creating PPE, sourcing medical equipment, bringing produce and food to communities in needs. And since these summits were virtual, it allowed clients from around the world to provide offers of help and to connect with these ventures. And so I think for us, while we are all incredibly keen to reconvene in person um, as soon as it is safe to do so, there are certainly elements from the virtual program that we'll look to maintain. Yeah, to I totally that. agree with that. I, I would just emphasize what Debbie was saying earlier. We've taken these demo days, which are always private gatherings for a very select group of individuals to show up physically in person. And mm -hmm. because of the pandemic, we've opened those up virtually. So anybody who's interested in moving capital can mm -hmm. now tap into those uh, and, sessions. Yeah. And just one plug. So we are bringing together on November 10th, our Unreasonable Impact World Forum, where you will hear from all of the companies this year. There's three different tracks. And so again, if you're interested in watching that, it is, it is incredible. Um, unreasonableimpact.com slash connect, drop us a note and Daniel's like texted me this last night many times. So you're doing please, awesome, to, Debbie. You're nailing it. <laughs> like I learned it wasn't backslash and it was just slash. So slash I yeah. <laughs> Not a backslash, just slash. This is all information that of course we can share in writing to follow up. Um, for all the attendees on right now. But I want to keep the questions moving along here. And we're gonna bring it back to you, Daniel, because one of our community members wants to know specifically, how do you measure the success or even forecast the impact of the Unreasonable Impact Program? That's double a great impact question. Program. Yeah, you know, I didn't, um, I actually didn't mention some of the uh, impact metrics uh, that, that the portfolio of companies has already achieved. And you know, the first one, I am most, most recently, as of this morning, it's over 62 million tons of carbon dioxide and methane have been removed from the atmosphere profitably. Um, 62 million tons um, across these companies. And if we look into one sector like solar electrification, over 170 million individuals now have access to solar because of the work of a number of the companies that we're supporting through the fellowship. 170 million people is half of the United States. Yet out of that 170 million people, over 100 million didn't have electricity before these companies brought them solar. Um, and so you know, we're measuring the impact um, in multiple dimensions. We actually took the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals uh, and we broke those down to about 350 indicators that are relevant to private business. Um, and all of the companies in the Unreasonable Impact Fellowship, they measure um, their impact alongside of those indicators as proximate as possible to their kind of core business model. Um, so that's something we measure and track on a regular basis. Uh, but uh, we also look at attributable capital. Right? You, you talked about it, Corey. 
uh, it's hard uh, to um, scale a business if you don't have capital and leverage is a really key word. Um, and so we're collectively tracking um, not just that the companies have raised over $5 billion in the last five years, but how much of that is actually directly attributable to the Unreasonable Impact Fellowship. Um, that's a key aspect of measurement. And, and then we do the regular things that all companies do like net promoter score. I, but, and um, we, all, we also look at um, the last one I would say is we track success attribution, uh, zero to 10. Uh, we say how much has uh, being in the Reasonable Impact Fellowship um, improved your ability to scale your company? Um, and a 10 uh, basically means uh, we couldn't have done it uh, without this relationship. And a one is, it's not bad. It's just saying you weren't that helpful. I am and right, <laughs> right, right now, right now we're in the low nines, uh, which is a pretty um, I'm humbling statistic. And doesn't have anything to do with us. It has to do with the community that we've been able to forge together. I am, because that community has, has pretty far reaching uh, access and resources. Okay, well, I wanna actually give you a quick shout out, um, Daniel from one of our community members, Nick Loom, who specifically wanted to say hi to you. Hello. And thank you <laughs> for the work that you've done with them reasonable. He actually goes on to say that four years later, he's still seeing the ripples of impact from opportunities that you all created for him at Unreasonable. So it's not that's a awesome. question, it's just showering you with some love. Oh, from the that's, community. that's awesome. Thanks, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, everyone, we are paying attention and we um, are just going to get to one last question here um, for all of our panels. And this is actually for each of you because the impact work, um, it's hard. The, the road is long, right? We're seeing strides there are things that are that are definitely moving the needle but for each of you and dr dyson we can start with you what keeps you truly optimistic about you know the progress being made in this space the main thing that i would say is that the that consumers are shifting so you need those that are spending the dollars to actually vote with their dollars and they need to vote for things that are environmentally friendly, things that have a positive impact on the world uh, in many different areas. And so um, people are the ones that are driving the change that we're seeing. If we look at environment specifically, it's because of the, you know, if we look at if we go even narrowly specifically to meat, which is where we're focused, um, you know, millennials are more likely to have a, uh, you know, meatless Mondays, meat-free diet in order to have a positive impact on the, the environment as an example. Uh, and so more and more people are making those shifts that are causing companies to make those shifts that are causing investors to make those shifts. So I think that is something that, that makes me hopeful um, and, and optimistic and more and more organizations like Unreasonable although unreasonable is unparalleled, are forming to try to move this uh, desire to have impact in the world forward. Debbie or Daniel, either one want to jump in? Uh, sure. So I would say, I think you can't help but be on optimistic when you're surrounded by this caliber of entrepreneurs, their technologies, and their businesses, right? And it gives me, um, I, I look to the private sector and, and just the incredible hope in, in the possibility, again, of, of a cleaner, more sustainable future. Um, and what's also really encouraging is that it, it's not just us seeing this, our clients are with us on this, right? The investor community is with us and we have been waiting for this for a decade and it, it's, it's all finally you know, coming together. So I think this is incredibly uh, exciting. And I think Lisa is, is really you know, a pioneer at the forefront of a, of a revolution. Yeah, I mean, not, not, not to make this a mutual admiration festival. Uh, but I think what gives me hope is actually the, the two women who are on this panel with me. Uh, Lisa's representative of the types of entrepreneurs that are creating the future of industry and they're doing it in a regenerative and sustainable way and they're going to outperform the market. And you can see that uh, just you know, by the, the value of the company. And it's just at the beginning of uh, what it's going to achieve. And so we have this bottom up optimism, as Debbie would say, with all the entrepreneurs that we get to work with. But I also have a top down optimism, and that's because of Barclays. You have one of the largest financial institutions in the world, over 300 years old, that is shifting its practices and orienting the entire business towards this direction. And you know, the truth is, there's a lot of multinationals that, that we work with and speak with. And I, there's not a boardroom that I haven't sat in of some of the world's largest institutions where each individual on that board didn't want to 
transition towards more sustainable business practices faster. Now, Barclays is doing it, uh, which is what makes me excited. But I'd, I'd say the will is there. I think there are trillions of dollars on, on the sidelines right now that are looking to participate in this next kind of revolution. And I think we look at the green economy, it's, it's as significant as the industrial revolution, but it's moving at the pace of the digital. I am, and that's exciting. Um, and to be clear, like winning slowly is the same thing as losing. We can't do it fast enough. Uh, so the last plug is just a reasonableimpact.com slash connect uh, if you all want to be a part of it because we are permeable and we're constantly looking to build out this community to support companies like Air Protein. And, and one final quick thing around Barclays in particular, as an investor in Air Protein, they are the, the leaders in pushing us to report out on our sustainability metrics. And just to see that coming directly from investors from a large bank is, is definitely gives me hope as well. Yeah. Hello, Olivia. Yes. Hello. Oh my goodness. I will jump in because I think we might've lost Corey. Wow. Um, I, I'm sort of blown away. I want to say first and foremost, because that's who I am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah, Daniel, Lisa, and Corey for such an audacious conversation. I, being part of the Social Innovation Summit, I know we just all learned so much and I'm so inspired that we are able to make a, I wrote stuff, I took a lot of notes, a carbon negative culinary protein made from air. Yeah. And then also, I just loved hearing, and I wrote this down too, I'm going to put on a post-it note, winning slowly is the same as losing. So if that's not the push that we all need, let's, let's go for it. Um, and then last but not least, I love this idea that we need to shift our mindset. Uh, again, I wrote it down from a competitive advantage to a collaborative advantage. So that's, I mean, amazing quotes came out of this entire conversation that I know everybody is going to be talking about for a long time and really using it to just energize all of us. So thank you for enjoying, uh, joining us for this really incredible and important conversation. We are entrepreneurs. We're talking about strengthening the economy of tomorrow and really just echoing Deborah's statement. Please visit www.unreasonableimpact.com to learn more. Um, we can do this together. Um, this collaboration is so important. You can check out their venture booklet containing all of their companies that have gone through the program since 2016, which is just so incredible to see. So please check it out. Um, if you wish to get in touch, please follow the form linked in the event chat box to sign up for their newsletter. I encourage you all to do that. So take a minute to do that. And then last but not least, again, back to gratitude. Um, thank you so much to our partners and friends at Barclays for hosting this conversation with Social Innovation Summit at UNGA 2021. Your creative courage and being a leader in change is just inspiring all of us. Um, the, you have the power and we are so excited to see the others that also have the power follow in your footsteps. So thank you for that. Okay. I'm shifting gears. Shameless plug. 2022 is around the corner <laughs> and, um, uh, we are really excited to be returning in person to Washington, DC for our annual flagship event taking place on June 7th. So please mark your calendars now. Seats and spots will be limited, but we want to see all of you there. Uh, we will be hosting our Social Innovation Summit. If you can't make it to DC for whatever reason, we have such a big global community. If you can't make it to Washington, DC, please join us. We have amazing events just like this one and the others that happen throughout the week uh, that take place throughout the year. So again, I'm ending with gratitude. Thank you to our amazing speakers. Thank you to our community. Everyone have a wonderful rest of the day. <laughs>